at the time of white settlement. 75,000 hectares of Eastern Australia, between Byron Bay and Lismore, was covered in lowland subtropical rainforest. Early European settlers eyed the rainforest soils for agriculture, with little understanding of the value or rarity of the forests themselves. They called it scrub, the big scrub, and they set out to clear it. In the early days, the wonders of rainforest timber went largely ignored. Some was saved for craft wood or building, but much was used for fence posts, even burnt as waste in the haste to establish dairy farms. By 1900, there was only about 1% left in small scattered fragments, isolated in a now alien landscape, often grazed by cattle and invaded by weeds. Those remnants were under immense extinction pressure. Few people understood their value or the urgent need to rescue them. But the big scrub always had its heroes. One of the first was forward-thinking dairy farmer, Ambrose Crawford. In 1934, with no examples of rainforest restoration to guide him, he set out to conserve a sample of the big scrub. Lumley Park in Alstonville. Before Ambrose took this on, a fella wanted to clear this patch for a horse paddock. <laughs> yeah, well, and I'm... Ambrose had a, a different idea. He said this would be a good area to preserve. Yes, indeed. And he was right. Ambrose led a delegation convincing Tinton Barshire Council to keep the 1.7 hectare patch of weed infested rainforest as a preserve for native trees. <laughs> His regular working bees, the first in December 1935, attracted a loyal band of locals. For the next 40 years, until Ambrose retired, aged in his 90s, he and his colleagues, slowly and steadily, unlocked the natural resilience of this rainforest remnant. These small remnants, many on private land, and in a damaged state, number less than a hundred. But conceivably, they could form the basis of a big scrub revival, a chance to securely conserve the plant and animal species of this unique ecosystem. In the 1970s and early 80s, with the dairy industry shrinking in size, large areas of cleared land were no longer grazed. Weeds, such as camphor and lantana, moved in and grew unchecked. There was now a ready seed source for weeds that could invade and dominate the remnants, particularly around the edges. But there was also a growing public awareness of conservation and a greater scientific understanding of the importance of rainforests and how to restore them. The region attracted a new wave of settlers with an interest in rainforest. There were multiple pioneering actions to restore the big scrub. Some of the early heroes include Alex Floyd at Victoria Park and Ralph Woodford at Rocky Creek Dam. Now, Alex Floyd was involved in the late 70s in the assessment of this reserve when it was acquired by a national park. We think it was about 72 or something like that when it happened and the cattle were removed. What there was was pasture surrounding a remnant. There were some isolated remnant trees 
and there was some camphor laurels and there was quite a little bit of weed here. There was probably lanhana here at that stage as well, but it was mainly all grazed down. The edges were in poor condition, but the core of the remnant didn't have any issues at all. There's no Madeira vine, there's no lantana. Mm -hmm. okay. There's virtually no ochre in there, there was no privet in there. Um, it was always the edges. So that little map shows you the size and shape of the remnant with respect to the size of the property. Healthy rainforest can repair itself if a gap is created, when a tree falls, or on a larger scale, cyclone damage, or a landslide. And we can leverage these inbuilt recovery processes. Here's how it happens in the forest, this gap's filling. The fig tree used to occupy that whole space above us there. It was an emergent tree. Plenty of vines, whip cane there, lawyer, lawyer vine here. These are important little ladders for uh, things like tree snakes and they flower and fruit, they're going to attract insects, birds, butterflies. Ecologists recognise various successional stages of regrowth, where particular groups of species dominate. The mature phase group forms most of the fully developed forest. These plants create a dense shady canopy. For large gaps, such as those created by clearing, the classic recovery sequence would start with pioneers. Light-loving, fast-growing, short-lived species. The next stage sees more early secondary species coming in. These are still relatively short-lived. Then more late secondary species which are longer-lived. As the gap fills, conditions will increasingly suit the shade-tolerant, mature phase species. And, over a few hundred years, the rainforest can reach maturity again. At least it can, in a well-functioning natural system. Now, the restoration site may be a long distance from other rainforest. How will the gap-filling plants reach it? A key process in rainforest restoration is the perch tree effect. In 79, Alex Floyd poisoned two camp laurels that were there. There was another big one there that wasn't taken out till later. And there were two here and there were scattered campers. Because as a rainforest ecologist, he understood that the mechanism by which rainforest recovers is largely through the spread of seed by birds that perch on other trees and they spread the seed that way. About 80% of the species in, in the big scrub are dispersed by birds or bats. The rest are mainly wind or just gravity. I think he had um, the idea that if you put early secondary or pioneer species out in the plantations then you would get migration from the remnant and other areas into those and nature in a way was making up its own mind about what came up and it would be a very interesting exercise to observe how regrowth gradually matures. Planting programs exploring these ideas were carried out in the late 1970s by the Richmond Valley Reforestation Association and later by national park staff and contractors, advised by Alex Floyd and his colleague, naturalist ranger Sandy Gilmore. So there would have been about, certainly less than 10 species planted in these plantations here and uh, we've got maybe 40 in this particular area of species that have come in, of which at least 30 or maybe 35 were not planted. Just recruited? Yeah. yeah. So we, as a whole, it's, it's uh, 64 species have come into this, uh, these plantations since planting. In order to facilitate the movement of this big scrub out into the yonders of the Kaikuyu um, Sea out there, then uh, trees were planted to facilitate that. And this was the beginning of rainforest restoration in my eyes, in my experiences here uh, in the early 80s. The perch trees are receiving sites for the seed. But the perch effect only works if there are nearby source sites with a good range of species. The sources are the remnants and the isolated trees. And if we get the genetics right, the sites that are now being restored can become viable sources themselves. 
at Rocky Creek Dam, what is now the Rainforest and Water Reserve, had been entirely cleared for farming, except for a few scattered trees. But there is a large remnant adjacent, Big Scrub Flora Reserve. Wherever you've got a perch, you've got the potential to grow a rainforest. Rocky Creek Dam's in a continuum with the natural forest system. Mm. So all the vectors that uh, bring rainforest or uh, spread rainforest are within a natural system here and they're working happily. The dam was constructed in 1953 and over the next 30 years, dense groves of lantana, privet and camphor took over much of the remaining land. The rest was mainly kaikuyu. Everything you see here is lantana. Mm. But you can see here through here, we've got, we've got kudgeries, red ash, we've got a really good mix of there's, there's red cedars, as you can see just through there. This is like the Rolls Royce of sites for for natural regeneration. We've got mm. the big expanse of Nightcap National Park, the biggest big scrub reserve, 300 hectares, right buffering on here. So every time you disturb anything here, source. whatever mm. happens here, it, what can happen, say, Victoria Park, you might get, you know, 25%, but well, you get 100% here. It's yep. maximum. In 1983, Rouse County Council employed uh, a horticulturist, Ralph Woodford, got up there, worked, worked around, cleared around some of the feature trees up there and started to plant in underneath. But what he noticed there was, was that regardless of how many he planted there, of course, loads and loads more came in, whether it was there in the seed bank or whether it was brought in by birds and, and, or other vectors. The other thing that Ralph noticed in, in those mid-1980s was that there was a, a grove of acacia melanoxlin here it was surrounded, I believe, I wasn't here, but uh, by uh, rafts of lantana and, ev and everything else. He then, he saw that the lantana, amongst the lantana was a lot of native plants. So he recognised that there was a, a process of recovery happening there, just like in his garden beds. So he worked actively on that lantana, bit by bit, because he didn't have many days work here per week. So as he removed the lantana, he freed up the natives that then became more and more prominent. Ralph, as, as Anthony said, was here long term. He knew this site really, really well. He knew, he knew when, when certain birds were going to be passing and taking certain seed with them. And a lot of sites, uh, the way funding opportunities often arise, you're sort of moving from one site to another site. You know, you never quite get a handle on a site. And that was the huge advantage that, that Ralph had. He had this really great knowledge and he was so observant. And what he was doing, like no one else was doing it up in this region. Um, through experience and watching uh, and trial and error that you eventually put together a methodology that works. And it's a methodology that's open to change. It's open to the seasonal fluxes and flows of nature. So it, you need to be very open as a restorationist. You need to be able to, uh, to change your methodology quickly if need be. These areas were basically massive rafts of lantana, there was privet, there was um, camphor laurel. Or he'd basically drive the tractor over the top of it with the slasher. He'd just drive into it. We'd do all that hard work in winter. Yeah, he'd be hacking all of that lantana down off all the trees with brush hooks and everything else. He'd be um, injecting the camphor laurels and the privets and then um, for the rest of the year he'd be actively, you know, you'd get the whole Blush of all the mm. annual weeds coming through, he'd come in and control that. Late winter, spring is a very dry time here, so when you treat lantana there, you don't get a lot of uh, regrowth of lantana. He mm. found there was some weed regrowth, uh, annual type <coughs> regrowth, regrowth, which he sprayed, but uh, after that it was massive regrowth of uh, rainforest pioneers. And the acacia grove was soon showing signs of progress through the stages of succession towards mature forest. After three years, eight later phase species were recorded. After 24 years, there were 22. By Ralph being able to demonstrate how you could manage these lands, we were then able to build a team that he could lead, and that was all funded as part of the water supply operations.
By the 1990s, a skilled restoration workforce was established and growing in the region as methodologies evolved and more and more people became formally trained in assisting natural regeneration and, increasingly, planting and a broadening range of projects offered employment. In parallel with the mentoring Alex Floyd and Ralph Woodford provided for the natural regeneration-focused approaches, other heroes of the Big Scrub were developing and teaching planting approaches. A more recent cohort of landholders joined the effort to restore the Big Scrub, many finding innovative ways to integrate restoration into their enterprises. In 1992, a group of passionate rainforest restoration supporters joined forces to form Big Scrub Land Care. They developed a strategic vision for Big Scrub recovery. Protecting and restoring the remnants was recognised as top priority. They are holding what's left of the Big Scrub's original genetic diversity. But the remnants can't survive in isolation. Connectivity needs to be restored. So the plants, animals and genetic material can move through the landscape again. The links between remnants don't always have to be continuous. For the more mobile animals, such as birds and bats, and the many plants that they pollinate or disperse, stepping stones of rainforest regrowth can provide much of the connectivity. And the total area of rainforest needs to increase. In the tiny fraction that survived, there isn't room for adequate representation of the original range of species, or for full expression of the remaining genetic diversity. Natural regeneration is the foundation tool for recovery adjacent to remnants. But with the level of fragmentation, regen alone won't be enough. Extensive and strategic planting is needed for finessing the species that we want and for reinstating the large areas that we need on country where natural regen potential has already been lost. And so far, there's been a big thing missing in the natural regeneration. The mature phase species. The plants that formed the vast majority of the original forest. And they're not just waiting for the right conditions. These are often short distance dispersers, now scarce in the wider landscape due to clearing. So to recover in large enough numbers, they'll need some extra help. White Buyong, which is a dominant of the associations of the big scrub, is wind dispersed. And we're not seeing it very much in these recovery uh, sites. It doesn't volunteer in open areas. It needs a, a degree of shade, but then it benefits from lack of competition. So we need to be quite careful and deliberate about replanting some of the important species. Ultimately, that's our goal, to have white bouillon dominance in the big scrub, but it might take 400 years to do it. Hmm. Starting from scratch to recreate healthy, viable rainforest using planting brings its own set of challenges, including long distances from remnants. The pioneers and early secondary species are the easiest to establish. But without the mature phase, it's a dead-end street. The shorter-lived plants can naturally senesce and fall over before being replaced by the longer-lived phase. Replicating the wider range of species is a harder task. Prominent among the planting-focused heroes was Len Webb. Rob Coyman built on his ideas, trialling small but highly effective plantings on his property, with many enthusiastic restorationists attending field days there. Restoration practitioner and nursery manager Mark Dunphy 
adapted those models to larger scale plantings. Key strategies are planting high diversity, high density stands, also thinning out dense stands of pioneers, ideally before they get too big, and planting a higher diversity of species in the gaps. The combination of regeneration and planting expertise led to an increased capacity and skill base that's left an expanding legacy of restored remnants and hundreds of hectares of well-structured, diverse rainforest plantings. But also expanding were the weeds, particularly camphor laurel, rapidly colonising and dominating much of the cleared area within the big scrub's original range. But could the camphor be part of the solution? Camphor conversion techniques leverage the perch value of the weed stands to foster rainforest regrowth. Alex Floyd's camphor poisoning in Victoria Park in 1978 had facilitated a progressive increase in natives. Then, in the 1990s, Ralph Woodford had poisoned a conspicuous stand of camphors at Rocky Creek Dam. Some rainforest plants had already germinated there after seed drop from birds attracted to the live camphor in its fruit. But rainforest regen went into overdrive once the shade and competition of the camphors were removed. The dead stags were retained and continued to act as perches. Camphor stands offer benefits, such as corridors, food and habitat for fauna. And they can attract some rainforest plant species, generally but not exclusively the pioneers, even if the source plants are far away. but it's far from a free ride. A lot of weeds also germinate under those camphors. Controlling those underneath has been a really big part of facilitating that recovery. Unlike classic rainforest pioneers, camphor lacks the short lifespan and the high turnover of leaves and branches that increases organic matter in the soil. And it doesn't thin out over time to let more light reach the ground. But it can act as a facilitator if there's a native seed source within reach and bush regenerators are there to poison the camphor, to keep on top of the weed regrowth and to introduce the mature phase species if they're not coming in. So saving the big scrub is not a straightforward story of regenerating some areas and planting others. In many cases, it needs both approaches. For the revived big scrub to last, the foundations we're building now need to be solid, whether we're talking remnants, regrowth or plantings. We'll need a lot of seed with good genetics. But so far, we've been collecting seed from too few parents, and that sets up future risks from inbreeding. So big scrub land care has launched the Science Saving Rainforests Genome Project. 30 key structural species and 30 threatened species have been selected for detailed genetic analysis. And two plantations are being established to produce seed for planting stock. This will guide the collection and production of propagation material with optimal genetics for future resilience. It's all about giving the big scrub the best possible chance of long-term viability and hopefully improve its chances of adapting to climate change. With good genetic diversity and the full complement of mature phase species, the restoration sites can serve as artificial remnants in terms of their seed source value. And with the cooperation of landholders, they can be strategically planned where they're most needed. One of the landowners to take up the cause in the 1990s is Big Scrub Landcare's executive chairman and founder, Tony Parks. The small remnant that had survived on his property is now surrounded by extensive replanted rainforest. This is a bit under a hectare, this, this uh, remnant. Uh, it's got a few threatened species in it. Um, 
and uh, it's just zooming along and lots of birds as you can hear and so uh, this is pretty inspiring to see what it was like it was cattle were through it there was the soil was compacted there was nothing no natural region was happening nothing in 95 we fenced this remnant off we uh, got rid of some campers that were it would land tana about 30 or 40 feet, you know, 10 or 20 metres up the trees. We got rid of all that. And the, the recovery, the resilience is spectacular. Mm. Once you keep the weeds under control and keep the livestock out, mm. bingo, it all happens. And that's the great thing about this ecosystem, this ecological community. It's terribly resilient if you get human impacts out of it or positive human impacts into it. Yeah. So this uh, site is about 10 years younger than the Ralph Woodford uh, dairy farm that we looked at today, which was much more dense um, and probably early successional compared to this that has a and also mix of latest species. You know, yeah. yeah. Right, right beside. And that's yeah. something the rest of us don't have. That, that could be yeah. That's a black bean, isn't it? Red yeah. Beans. I mean, red sorry, bean, red bean, bean. Yeah. yeah. Red bean. And so are these coming from the remnant or we don't know where they're coming? We don't know where. They, they, they um, are prodigious... Regenerate. Regenerate it. Right, excellent. And they're, they're, they're a big uh, canopy species. Yeah, nice, great tree. Some of the, uh, the fruits in these rainforest species are too big to be spread by current fauna. Wampu pigeon is the greatest spreader and it can take the biggest seeds. But things with big seeds were probably <coughs> spread by uh, cassowaries or something else that's gone extinct in this area. So the distribution of their seeds is zero. Well, my understanding is that, that each species of rainforest tree has some generalist fungi and some, some special, specialised ones. So there are thousands of species of fungi. And what we've never worked out is how the hell do we get the fungi into the plantings? But, you know, they obviously are, remain in the soil for a long time. And in some areas, I guess they, there are more of them than others. And that maybe is one of the factors as to why some areas where you're doing plantings grow quickly and others grow slowly. So this species here goes back 180 million years, so it's quite rough and I can envisage dinosaurs coming along and rubbing their itchy back. <laughs> these black trees. That's all about. We've, got, uh, we've got another family of trees in the big scrub, pot of carbon, and their lineage goes back 240 million years. So this is a seriously ancient Gondwana origin forest. Yeah. Almost unique in the world. We have a higher proportion of Gondwana species than any other forest. The remnants in the big scrub, if you exclude the three big ones up in the uh, edge, of, on the northern edge of the Nightcap National Park, the average separation of the remnants is six kilometres, oh, sorry, three kilometres, and their average size is six and a half hectares. So they're pretty fragmented and they're pretty isolated. And the penalty of isolation and fragmentation are small populations, and some of those populations are too small to be self-sustainable. In the 80s, there were hundreds of trees planted every year. In the 90s, thousands. In the 2000s, it was tens of thousands. The 2020s could see hundreds of thousands of plants in the ground every year. And every year, more diversity and a greater success rate. And that's in addition to the larger and larger areas of weedy regrowth being assisted to regenerate back to healthy rainforest. Increasingly, First Nations people are recognised, respected and involved. The combined result is a powerful process of landscape change. And we're going to need it the big scrub has been around for millennia. But today's challenge of increasing fire, flood and drought may be more than it's ever faced. Yeah. What motivated me? Distress at the loss of part of Australia's biodiversity. Yeah. We've lost so much, we've lost so many species and this community was in danger of going out the back door. And it still is. Mm -hmm. It still is because of the problems of isolation and fragmentation and lack of genetic diversity. A revitalised big scrub 
will bring a wide range of new social and economic opportunities. But what's needed now is a broader range of people taking part and a new set of stories, a new mindset reminding us that it's in all our interests to value and care for this unique rainforest ecosystem. So the future of the big scrub doesn't depend on the extraordinary efforts of a few. But it did take an extraordinary group of people to give us this chance. Where, at this critical point in our history, saving the big scrub is still a choice we are able to make. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>